So first, I really like to thank everyone for having me. I'm a country mouse from Monterey, California. So I really appreciate MacArthur and Neiman and Belfer Center for uh, flying me all the way out to the big city. <laughs> <laughs> And um, normally the way I interact with everyone is through social media um, in my jeans and torn up shirt. So it's really, this is a brand new jacket. I already tried to put the microphone in it. Sewn up, can't. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I have met, met, many of you have already phoned me or emailed me or DM'd me for quotes on North Korea breaking news. And that's actually sort of like my passionate hobby that happens after hours. Um, but day to day, the mission of Center for Nonproliferation's actual, uh, uh, you know, uh, job is to do research uh, that is, we're a non-advocacy organization. We do research and training related to non-proliferation. And we already had an introduction to what non-proliferation is. Almost everyone thinks of it as nuclear weapons spreading to another country, which is horizontal proliferation, but it is also vertical proliferation, which means countries getting more nuclear weapons than they used to have. And it applies to all weapons of mass destruction. And at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, we do study biological, chemical, nuclear weapons and their delivery devices. So the way you actually get those weapons to their final des destination. And that means I spend a lot of time looking at missiles. And so today, I thought that I would talk about procurement and proliferation through basically the most sophisticated procurement and proliferation network I know, which is North Korea's. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how they procured the things they needed to make their weapons and how they proliferate to other countries. And that involves uh, export controls, uh, uh, sanctions busting, uh, smuggling, uh, money laundering, and sometimes even bartering through other Ill illegal or illicit traffic, like drugs and things like that. Um, so North Korea got its nuclear, or so, so we, there was some debate, I guess, about when North Korea originally started its nuclear program, but the US did indeed threaten to nuke North Korea during the Korean War, and the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, said, screw this, we're getting a nuclear program. They started building up schools to educate the country for that mission. In the mid-1970s, they got their first Scud missiles. Uh, so these are Soviet-made. These are the most widely proliferated missiles in the whole world. These missiles are everywhere, in part thanks to North Korea. North Korea had a... Uh, 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 USSR and China both pissed off in this time period. They could not, for the life of them, get what they needed from them, so they actually went and got it from Egypt. So this is a case where Soviet Union exported to Egypt, Egypt exported it to North Korea, then North Korea reverse engineered the Scuds, made two versions which are really hard to tell the difference of, called Hwasong-5 and Hwasong-6, Sometimes you'll see them listed as SCUD B or SCUD C. And then they made a SCUD ER, which stands for extended range. And literally all they did was take the original design of the missile and the engine and scale it up a little bit. So it is a bigger SCUD with a, an engine that is a bigger SCUD engine. It holds more fuel, an oxidizer, it's a liquid fueled missile, and it goes a little bit farther with the trade-off that it's also a little bit heavier. And then they made the Nodong, which is even bigger. The Nodong missile is uh, not shown in this picture. So this here is North Korea. This is a secret, super secret photo, thanks to journalists. Um, and, and that's something else I'd love to end on, is talking about how we work with journalists and how you know, we're complementary. Um, this is uh, from a Burmese or Myanmarese group who went shopping for scuds from North Korea. Uh, the, one of the members of the team leaked the photos to journalists, and these photos got circled, circulated so widely that we got to see what it looks like when North Korea uh, export sells for sale its missile technology. 
And so there's very few photos of this, but we can now identify where this place is, just outside of Pyongyang. We got trip notes from that, and so we learned a lot more about how they sell missiles. Um, they then turned around, and these are 3D models, because we were really trying, and this is thanks to NTI. NTI funds our 3D modeling project. But um, this is the Nodong missile here on the left, and we went and we measured very, very carefully to see if there really, truly were any differences. And no, the Sh Iranian Shahab-3 missile in the middle is exactly the same with a different paint job, and on the right, Pakistan's Gowry missile, exactly the same with a different paint job. So now we can see, okay, so North Korea proliferated its nodong, which is like a stretched out scud, and started selling them to other countries, including Iran and Pakistan. Now, now all three countries have nuclear capable missiles, or WMD capable missiles. North Korea and Iran did not have warheads yet. So um, what does North Korea need to make its missile and, and sort of nuclear program? This is, I'm focusing primarily on missiles here because this was what was leaked from State Department cables. So this is officially, as long as you trust the cables were not tampered with any way, what the US, MTCR, and Russia thought they needed. And this is, so this is missile focused. So they needed com component testing equipment they needed heat resistant materials for the reentry vehicle. They wanted heavy duty vehicle chassis. What is that? Who cares? <laughs> Missile tracking technology, precision machine tools and software. What are they? Woodworking? Who cares? Specialty steels and aluminums, right? So this is the light materials you would need for everything. Ball bearings? Are you kidding me? Can't they just go to like Home Depot and get those things? <laughs> precision gyroscopes. So not like the thing your kid plays with, but like really like accurate ones. And then solid and liquid propellant precursor chemicals to make their fuels. That is what they estimated. And sure enough, when the UN panel of experts, which is a fantastic resource for journals, the report I think I've heard is already leaked. It usually leaks about this time. It will come out in like uh, this month. Um, the report itself is nice, but my favorite part is the back of the report, there is annexes. And it's nothing but primary documents and diagrams and explanations of banking networks. What's this called? The UN Panel of Experts Report. On North Korea. On North Korea. There is no longer one on Iran. And um, so this is a, a cutout this was after the UNHA-3 space launch vehicle was launched. Um, and, and the South Koreans went out and recovered the debris from that missile. And then everyone wanted to see, well, what was inside? Where did it come from? And sure enough, the stuff, so North Korea actually booby traps the stages of their missile or their space launch vehicles now so that they ex explode. And it's hard to recover this stuff. But they've done still a pretty good job recovering and so you can see, sure enough, ball bearings, trans temperature transmitters, pressure transmitters, uh, electric cables. It's like, it's, it's like cheap, low-level electronics that are really hard to control. And where is it coming from? Former USSR, so some of it is old. But it's still coming from the United Kingdom, China, Switzerland, the United States, Republic of Korea and so on. So they're still getting this stuff. And it's because they're really good at defeating our export controls, our attempts to prevent smuggling, things like that. Why are they getting this stuff instead of making it themselves? Well, they don't. So I mean, I don't know how many times in this conference alone we've said North Korea is backwards. So yes, OK, they're backwards. But they really know how to marshal their resources towards getting what they want. It's not unlike Pakistan eating grass, right? So for them, currently, the calculation they're making is that it is cheaper for them to illicitly procure these types of items using money laundering and embassies, and you would not believe, in order to get these items than to try to build the industrial 
infrastructure you need to make these cost effective like you would go buy them at Home Depot or something like that. So the way North Korea does this kind of thing is that they use front companies. So these are companies that are really hard for us to track because they maybe they have like a few people of a few different nationalities. They're incorporated in one country. Uh, they may have board members of legitimate companies on there. Um, they will have overseas agents who will act as brokers. And so you many times you'll have a North Korean person who lives in China doing quasi-legitimate business and then slipping a few things through. Um, they use transshipment countries. So you will get very complex sort of shipping activities, which by itself still looks like noise as we do data analysis because shipping is just complicated these days. It's not, nor it's not unrealistic for Taiwan to ship something to Kuala Lumpur, to ship something to Dubai, to ship something to the United States. That's the most e cost effective way of shipping. Um, they use embassies. So one of the things we do search for is we're, when we're looking at sort of the, the organization's structure, we're comparing it to who works at the embassy, what the address of the embassy. So North Korea's embassy in Singapore was really busted with, I think, radios and light arms because the company business address was the North Korean embassy. <laughs> Not so good. And, and reporters blew that open. Um, and uh, financial institutions, so yes, Despite all the efforts and all the pressure on banks to not receive North Korean money, North Korea still trades in euros and in US dollars. And they do that, again, by having front companies who look like they're doing quasi-legal um, activities or the most difficult to stop thing. And again, I got this from a reporter um, who wanted documents verified is they will do ledger transactions. So a North Korean will have a suitcase of cash, they will move to China, they will open a personal checking account and a personal savings account. Um, they will show documents that either say they're South Korean or that they're Chinese or they'll have a, a cinified version of their name. Um, or they may indeed use a Chinese citizen to open this bank for them. And then it becomes, you can't, it's not, because you can't identify the accounts themselves as being interesting, it's up to the bank to identify the transactions being suspicious. So what you start looking for are sort of small amounts of a specific going out of one bank account into another bank account. And you can get these huge hairball diagrams that I can show you later if you're really interested in, of all the people and entities that are connected to each other. And alone, it means nothing. But as a whole web, a whole network, it can start to look suspicious once you start identifying some of the bad actors in that. Another thing that is really complicated that you've been seeing popping up in the news is they're actually doing ship-to-ship -ship transfers. So they'll pull their ship up next to another ship in the middle of the night, and they'll physically take cargo off, put it on the other ship. So when Customs is there and says, okay, you're a Brazilian flagship, and you're coming into China, and you're doing this totally legitimate thing we think you're doing, no, there's probably something stuffed in there that shouldn't. And I think some of the big cases we've seen before is they're, they're shipping around sugar, they're refurbishing equipment that they've already done, and they're slipping stuff in there. So we have a few kind of shots of that. But the really complicated thing is this is boring work, right? Like that's sort of why we get paid to do it. It's hard and it's boring. This is what a diagram looks like. This is North Korea getting a Japanese magnetometer into Myanmar for the purpose of Probably, and like Corey said, this is a dual use item. So you can't say, hey, Myanmar, screw you. You are not allowed to have a high precision machining tool, which could be used for automotive purposes. Like, so if you're making a Prius or something, you would use ring magnets in your car, something like that. But this specific kind of machine is really tough to follow. Um, and I think this, to me, machine tools in general, computer numerically controlled machines, they're like the least sexy thing possible. But this is what North Korea is getting, old refurbished machine tools. 
lathes and um, these kinds of things. And they're not your like grandpa's woodworking lathe. They are super high precision. And so yes, you can use them in aeronautics or in auto manufacturing or all these kinds of things, but you can definitely use them in missile and nuclear applications. And once North Korea has this manufacturing ca capability in the country, they start replicating them. So now this, just like the Scud missile, is a reverse engineered North Korean version of a machine tool, which they are now selling uh, through Russian and Chinese companies. And we found the website selling them. And sure enough, it's, so what is this though? What is really an additive manufacturing capability? Does anyone use like Blue Apron, <laughs> right? So like they got your own DIY missile and nuclear kit here now. Now it's not that customs officials and people on the border are looking for um, ball bearings and um, flow forming vacuum pumps and all these kinds of sort of, they're making it themselves. They brought the manufacturing from an advanced industrial country into their own. Now what we have to look for are the, the raw materials that are used coming in. Soon, once we go to like 3D printing kind of, so this is subtractive, once we go to additive manufacturing, we're just gonna be looking for the powders. And that's really hard to stop in a ship. So yes, this is a huge problem. Um, if there is good news, I would say that by watching the, sh the, the ship to ship um, sort of seizures and things, North Korea has done a pretty bad job at selling their missiles. In fact, Iran and Pakistan, those places I were, was pointing to before, Myanmar didn't buy. Um, Iran and Pakistan are better at missiles, or so we thought, until this latest generation. So the missiles we're now seeing tested in 2016, 2017, and now, these are new missiles. These are not related to the Scud family. These are probably indigenous missiles. There is a lot of debate about them that I won't, uh, people were talking about shouting in an airport or something like, we won't do that here, but there are plenty of people um, who disagree about how big they are and what they are and so on. So we have calculations on this. I am very lucky I'll keep to do, doing some of these. But for me, the thing we have to watch for now are boring heavy duty chassis. So basically, we're looking for new or used construction vehicles. Um, uh, uh, okay, I'm running out of time. Sorry. Uh, so, so these kinds of things, these are the launchers. These are the future launchers of North Korea's missiles. They can only launch however many launchers they have. They can only move missiles around for how many they have. So this is what that turned into, right? This was a Chinese heavy duty truck. Well, now it holds a, a, a smallish missile, and now it holds a huge missile. We asked about whether North Korea would be willing to proliferate warheads. It's a possibility. And the, sh the more they're pressured and low on cash, maybe. Traditionally, countries haven't wanted to proliferate. They want to keep the warheads for themselves. North Korea is not traditional. They have fishing boats. They have smuggling routes. They have money laundering. They're very low on cash right now. <coughs>